you probably guessed by now, this is MTV, and I'm tonight's guest DJ, Billy Idol. Actually, of course, it's American Literature English 245, and I'm Mr. Watkins. The purpose of this tape is basically threefold. First of all, to explain the objectives. Secondly, to give you a little background on the course. And third, to give you some background on our first reading assignment, William Bradford's History of the Plymouth Plantation. You'll need uh, two things to follow this tape. First, a copy of the objectives, which should be on piles on the table in the front of the room, which looks like something like this, which is, of course, too blurred for you to be able to see it, but nevertheless, uh, <coughs> you'll recognize it. The second thing is a copy of the exam. This is a copy of, also invisible, this is a copy of last semester's final exam, the exam that is mentioned in the objectives. If you look at the credit, and we'll use it, by the way, as a kind of study guide during the course, fill it in, review it before we take the final. About 80% of it will be the same as the final that we'll be taking at the end of the course. If you take a look at the objectives, you'll notice that uh, <clears throat> on all three levels, there are essentially two requirements for the course. First, a fi the final exam, and secondly, a paper. The paper varies in quantity and quality from one level to another. If you look first at the credit assignment, you'll notice that uh, <clears throat> there's a test which is required, which is essentially the objective test, the one that has been passed out, which you have, and you need to score 70% or better on that test. Uh, you also need to participate in the group work. I'll explain the group work momentarily, but what it means is reading the assignment, coming prepared to be able to discuss it uh, in, a ter in terms of the, group as the assignment that the group will have. The third thing is writing a paper. The credit paper is three to five pages long. That's typed, of course. And it analyzes one author covered in class from either a literary, historical, or biographical standpoint. Essentially, that's the way the course is pretty much arranged. We'll be discussing early American writers, um, colonial writers in particular, at least at the beginning of the course. And we'll be looking at them from three basic perspectives. The first is the biographical. Um, there are a number of different forms of criticism, and each of them has a different assumption. Biographical assumption is that any piece of literature could only be written by the author of that piece of literature and is the sum total of his experiences in life up until that point, and that those life experiences are the primary determinant of how the work is shaped, what's in it, how well it's done, everything about it. The second assumption, of course, is historical. That is, that the main factor which influences how an author writes are the events of his times. For example, a writer writing before the Civil War has certainly got a different perspective than a writer writing after the Second World War, and a much different perspective than, say, a 20th century writer. Many of the writers we'll be discussing are from the 18th and 19th century, and the historical setting that they wrote in determined how they could write to a large extent. For example, 19th century um, had no television, no radio. Uh, people more or less made their own entertainment. After dinner, the family sat around and read aloud to one another. A book was expected to uh, entertain the family for several days and was often read and reread uh, several times. Also, members of the family might, uh, most people, in fact, in the 19th century, could quote at length a number of poems and, in fact, declaim them, say them aloud. Thus, the times encouraged much longer and more flowery works than would be acceptable today, with today's shortened attention span. Uh, most of us now have an attention span that's been conditioned to uh, about 12 and a half minutes through the use of television. Every 12 and a half minutes, we have to have a pause for three and a half minutes for a commercial. So we're used to getting our information in shorter uh, clumps and therefore we expect the same out of, out of print. You can see then the historical approach, the times that you live in, determine to a large extent the kind of writing that can be done. The third uh, way of looking at literature is from the literary historical approach, and that takes the assumption that the most important uh, thing in determining how and what a writer writes are the literary movements to which he's exposed. All writers are, very, are first of all, readers, and they the stuff that they read has been written with a certain number of assumptions. Every writer has to decide certain things about the function of literature, for example. What is literature for? Is it 
to present the writer's emotions? Is it a way for him to get those emotions out? Is it a way to make people look at their society, perhaps critically? In other words, is propaganda the main function of literature? Uh, is the function of literature to present the world pretty much as it is, a picture of the world and almost a photograph of the world done in words? Is the function to present the world as it is so that underlying scientific principles can be derived from it? All these, of course, have been put forward by different literary movements. The movements that we're going to be covering as part of the course, um, we'll deal with, they're all sort of laid out step by step. Um, one of the things that makes literature scary to some people is the fact that the terminology is never really completely explained, like what is neoclassicism and what is romanticism? They sound like very difficult concepts. In fact, when, as you will have, and in some of the group work uh, that we'll be getting into, we'll have a concept like that laid out with all of its characteristics, and then we'll apply it to the writer, generally in the group. Uh, there's not much sense being a group leader, by the way, if you're just going for credit. Being a group leader is uh, worth a grade on either the, on either the final or uh, the paper. If you're going for credit honors, as you can see, you do two parts of the objective test, <coughs> of the final test, rather, the objective part and a short essay part. In addition, although the objectives that you have say that it's required to be a group leader, in fact, it's not. Being a group leader is optional. However, it is worth a grade on the paper or on the final. You notice also that the paper under credit honors is longer than the credit paper, five to seven pages instead of three to five. It's also qualitatively, as well as qualita quantitatively, um, more complex. This, the credit honors paper requires not merely telling how uh, one writer's life or his times or the literary movements affected how he wrote, but comparing and contrasting two writers in terms of either how their life, uh, their historical times, or the literary movements they were exposed to affected their work. The high honors requires three parts of the test. The objective test, which everybody takes, the short essay, which is taken by the credit honors, and a long essay portion to the test. In addition, there is a paper which is longer and qualitatively more difficult. Um, the paper is seven to nine pages long. It <coughs> also is done on two writers that we haven't read in class, which requires you to do research in addition to what you would have to do for the credit honors paper. If you look at the second alternative, which requires uh, more creativity than the other approach. That is, you make up five aesthetic criteria. Now, aesthetic essentially means to search for the beautiful. Uh, but in practical terms, it means how do you know what's good or bad? Uh, five aesthetic criteria would be five things. For example, let's say you did the short story. You would make up five criteria that a good short story has to have. And of course, we'll be exposed to some of them as we go through the course. Poe, for example, uh, set up a number of criteria um, for the short story that it has to be read in a single sitting. You might add things like it has to have a happy ending, it should have um, characters that are easily identified with, um, it has to have a lot of action. And then of course, you, taking those criteria, you would look at writer number one and say, this writer is, a, is the better of the two writers because he meets each this first criteria in this way, the second criteria in that way, and so on, and be able to, of course, make references to the works to support your point. And then contrast him with the other writer, the other writer isn't as good because he doesn't make as, uh, he doesn't manage to have exciting characters or he doesn't have as, as uh, much action in his, in his stories and so on. In other words, you have to make up the criteria yourself and that is more difficult than simply applying criteria that have already been made. Uh, in any case, all three require a test and the paper. Now, the group work, generally, we will be applying usually a uh, a concept, one of the literary movements, to a specific writer or a pair of writers. Um, the function of the group leader is, first of all, to organize the group. Um, you'll be getting a sheet, say, with the 15 characters, characteristics of neoclassicism. I know neoclassicism right now sounds kind of scary, um, but it's really, you'll find that it's really much, much simpler than you were ever led to believe that it was. Um, the group leader then organizes the group, who's going to do which poems and apply which criteria to them and so on, and also is the spokesman for the group when the groups come back together in the class as a whole. 
as I said, it's worth one grade on either the paper or, or, the, or the test. So, for example, <clears throat> if you were going for high honors, you might do a credit honors paper, be a group leader, and then you would only need to do the first portion of the test, the objective test. The, being a group leader would take care of the short essay. Or if you were going for high honors, you might do a credit honors paper, be a group leader, which would bring that up to high honors, and then do all three portions of the test, which again would give you the high honors grade. If you have any questions on the objectives, write them down, and I will be here live and in person next week. It won't be, this is, I know, sort of like uh, talking to somebody's answering service, but um, next week I'll be here. So write the questions down, and we've got a long time to go in the semester, so there's no reason to panic. There's no real, there's no real hurry. Um, if you have any questions about what's been covered so far, of course, we'll be able to, I'll be able to answer any of your questions next week. Uh, the background to the reading, uh, <coughs> Bradford is a Puritan writer, as will be a number of the writers who will be covering in the first half of the course. To understand <coughs> what he's doing, you have to understand a little bit about Puritanism, which is a Protestant sect, actually, and I just, first let me separatist which Bradford belonged to um, historically. Initially there was only one church in Christendom <coughs> for about 1500 years. Um, during that time it gradually began to acquire political power primarily starting with the Crusades which uh, were an attempt by Christianity to free what uh, were the Holy Lands, what were considered sacred ground to them, namely Jerusalem from the Muslims to whom it was also sacred. Um, this required a lot of a lot of money. Money, of course, naturally leads to politics. And by the 1500s or, or somewhat earlier, the uh, the Universal Christian Church had developed uh, a large political base. It signed treaties. It carried out wars and so on. And of course, it needed money for that. Uh, it's one of the ways to raise money around 1500. There were a lot of reasons for the separation, but the straw that broke the camel's back essentially was the selling of indulgences. It was a uh, priest named Tetzel who was going around selling what were called indulgences. That is, um, they were sort of licenses to sin, more or less. Um, if you paid a certain amount of money, you had a minor, they, you couldn't buy them for murder or any, any big crimes, but any minor crimes like oh, adultery or covetousness or gluttony or whatever, you could buy an indulgence. And then when you did it, you were already free. You didn't, you didn't have any sin accruing to you because of, because of that act. Uh, there was another priest named Martin Luther who went absolutely crazy uh, over that idea. He said that uh, you, you can't buy God, quite simply. You can't bribe him. And this and about 99 other things, 98 other things that he, he disliked about the, about the Universal Christian Church, he nailed on a door, uh, uh, door in Wittenberg and began what was called the Reformation, which meant that the Church of Christendom split first into two parts, uh, what is now the Roman Catholic Church and the Protestant sects. Uh, initially there was only one, but they began to multiply, and soon there were a great number of them. Uh, of those Protestant sects, Puritanism was one form, primarily English. At the time, everyone assumed that it was perfectly normal and right for each individual nation to have its own official religion. What they disagreed on, of course, is what religion it ought to be. Um, when the Protestants were in power, they persecuted the Catholics as witches and burned them at the stake. When the Catholics were in power, they burned the, uh, burned the Protestants at the stake and considered them witches. And this warfare went on for over a hundred years. Uh, in the meantime, the Church of England had split off and become separate under Henry VIII. Henry wanted to divorce. Um, the Universal uh, Christian Church wouldn't give it to him, so he simply declared him the church independent in England and made himself the Pope. Uh, that church was primarily the ones that the Puritans wanted to purify, which is where, they, where their name came from. They didn't want to go away from it. They simply wanted to make some changes in it. Among the changes they wanted to make were uh, changes in the church hierarchy. They were basically political changes from, from our perspective, although uh, to the Protestants they had a very um, strong religious basis. For example, under universal Christendom, the assumption was that 
although you could talk to God directly, it was much better if you had someone to intercede for you. The saints, the pope, the bishops, the local priest. Um, the Puritans in particular, because the English church had kept the same hierarchy that the universal uh, Christian church had had, uh, wanted to change that hierarchy entirely. Their basic assumption was that the relationship between man and God is a direct one, that you don't need anybody to intercede between you. Because of this, of course, the uh, Protestants as a whole, and the Puritans in particular, strongly favored uh, universal education. If you're going to deal directly with God, God's word is in the Bible, you have to know how to read to read the Bible. And so on. In fact, the fact that there is a Brookdale is probably the direct result of the Puritans having landed here, because one of the first things that they did was to establish schools in order to get universal literacy so everybody could read the Bible. The second reform that they wanted was to get rid of this hierarchy that had existed, even in, the, even in the English church, and to replace it with locally elected presbyters, um, locally elected churches, the congregation would form their own church, hire their own ministers, nobody would uh, assign a priest or a minister to them, and so on. And they didn't want to be part of a larger hierarchy. Uh, now, this is a politically dangerous idea at the time because with the assumption that there ought to be a national religion, it has to be the religion of the king. Kings ruled by divine right. If you deny their interpretation of divinity, you're de denying their right to be king. And quite naturally, the kings uh, persecuted anybody who disagreed with the religion which they happened to follow, or the form, actually, of Christianity which they happened to follow. Uh, the Puritans, again, wanted to purify some of the liturgy of the church, put it into English, um, they wanted to get rid of a few of the sacraments, um, and they wanted that basic political reorganization. Uh, the separatists, on the other hand, had given up on purifying the Church of England. Uh, they assumed that the Church was so corrupt that there was no reforming it, no purifying it, that you had, they had to leave it entirely and establish their own congregations, their own church. Now, to do this at the time was a very dangerous thing. Uh, the penalty for treason, and treason, don't forget, meant not only being politically against the king, but simply following a different religion from the king, because that denies his divine right. Um, so following a different religion was punished as treason, and the punishment for treason was, uh, first of all, to be hanged until you were almost dead. Then you were cut down and disemboweled. Your intestines were cut out while you were still alive. And then they attached um, each arm and each leg to a horse and whipped the horses in different directions quartering or pulling the person apart into four parts. So that anybody who um, practiced another religion, as Bradford and his group did, and Bradford and his group were in fact probably considered the most dangerous uh, group at the time because they weren't, they were completely denying the structure of, uh, of the English church at the time, um, particularly risked this torture and death, this punishment for treason. Uh, Bradford's group in fact moved out of England because of the because of the persecution, um, they moved to Holland. Now, in order to do this, they made a, a, a very dangerous uh, trip, not merely physically, but just to get out of England was dangerous. If you were caught leaving, that was an act of treason, and you got hung, disemboweled, drawn, and quartered, naturally. Um, that meant you couldn't take much money with you. Your property and lands had to stay in England. If you started selling off the lands, the king would get wise that you were going to leave because of your religion and you'd have been uh, denounced as a traitor and, and uh, so on. Now, the, in fact, the Scrooby group that uh, Bradford belonged to he used to have to fight its way to church and back. Uh, the, the neighbors naturally didn't like them, threw stones at them, called them names whenever they went. Now, to avoid that kind of persecution, as I said, they went to Holland. Holland was not all that tolerant of other religions if you happened to be Dutch. If you were born there and lived there, you had to be Dutch Reformed. That was it. But if you came in from another country, um, the Dutch pretty much left you alone. So the Puritans, when they moved there, did get for a while the kind of religious freedom that they had been seeking. The problem, of course, was that they began to get wealthy. There are several parts of Puritan religion that lead towards that. But before I explain those to you, let me explain the background of, of, that leads to the ideas which make them better businessmen. Uh, first of all, 
even when there was one Christian church, there was a great disagreement over the idea of predestination and free will. On the predestination side is uh, Augustine of Hippo. And essentially what he says is that God is just rather than merciful. And that all things are predetermined. That, and that God, when he thought up the world, knew everything that was ever going to happen. Where you're sitting right now, um, where I'm sitting right now, what I'm going to say in the next two minutes, which I have no idea of has all been planned out before everything, anything began to form, billions and billions of years before. Um, as soon as God thought up, because God is infinite, as soon as God thought up creation, he thought it up whole, he thought it up complete. It was finished from beginning to end uh, when he thought of it. All that happens since then is the actual manifestation or the making physical of that idea. But that idea was complete in all of its details. Nothing could be changed. According to Augustine, um, now, God, because of his, uh, he was perfectly justified in destroying the whole of mankind because of what happens in the Garden of Eden. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, first of all, before that, one of the angels called Lucifer decides that he could run heaven better than God and stirs up a rebellion. He's thrown out of heaven into what's considered hell and continues to wage war against God through uh, trying to corrupt mankind, trying to destroy God's creation. <clears throat> comes to the Garden of Eden as, an, as a snake. Initially, now this is another part, the uh, Puritans in particular uh, were very legalistic. They believed in a covenant theory that uh, man and God had made a contract, a legal binding contract. Uh, the contract essentially said that uh, on God's part, God said to Adam and Eve, you can live here in the garden rent free, do anything you want, name the animals, ride the animals, have a good time, um, but don't eat from that tree over there. That's the one thing they had to do. And of course, the serpent, Lucifer, comes along, convinces uh, Eve to eat the apple. When she eats the apple, she gains knowledge. What she actually gains is a distorted knowledge of God's plan. Nevertheless, she's broken the contract. Adam eats the apple, he's broken the contract. Now, if your parents had signed a contract with somebody and had received money to deliver certain goods, and then died. The contract isn't void. You become responsible for delivering those goods or for suffering the penalties for not having them delivered. Now, according to the Puritans, this is just exactly what happened. God and Adam and Eve had a contract. Adam and Eve broke the contract, and the penalties for the contract fall on all of their descendants. Everybody since Adam and Eve had what the Puritans called original sin. Sin derived from Adam because of the contract. To them, God was perfectly justified in destroying the whole of mankind because they're all descended from Adam and Eve and they all bear the guilt of Adam's having broken the contract. We all have to pay off that mistake. Uh, according to Augustine, God is nevertheless going to save some people. Not a great many people, maybe, but he's going to save some. This is part of his infinite mercy. He's not required to save anybody. Um, he's perfectly justified in destroying anybody. Now, who he's decided to save was determined before the world began to form. Uh, these people who are going to be saved are called the elect, at least to the Puritans. Um, to him, man is essentially worthless, but God will save some people. The people he's going to save are, again, already programmed. Nothing really can be done to change it. Around the same time, uh, Augustine, of course, came from Hippo. It's in Africa. Um, it's a place where it comes from the, from, the, from the east, which is a place which depended on irrigation. Because it depended on irrigation, it uh, had to have a hierarchy in order to run the large irrigation system. And it has naturally a hierarchical idea of both the world and the relationship between God and man. There's another guy around the same time called Pelagius who comes from Britain. Britain has no irrigation. It, was a gr it had always been um, hunters and uh, not even so much gatherers, primarily hunters, who emphasize the individual. You can see how it's the same strain with, with Protestantism as opposed to um, the universal um, Christian church, which was hierarchical. In any case, Pelagius said, first of all, um, there is no original sin. Uh, not only everybody starts from scratch and is either, is either destroyed eventually or uh, given immortality based on what they've done in their, in their particular life. Um, he believed that 
people had absolute free will, that things were not predetermined, that even if God had determined the general lines of history, each individual's life was entirely their own. They were the ones who do, would eventually decide by their actions whether or not they were damned and destroyed or whether or not they were saved. Um, uh, Pelagius' idea is that you can gain moral and spiritual power. You can develop them yourself, first by acts of faith and secondly by uh, acts of mercy and charity to other people. In other words, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. Uh, about 1100 years later, a guy named Calvin comes along in Geneva. And Calvin is, it, believes in strict predestination. The elect have been picked. Not only have the elect been picked, but they um, inevitably do good. It's predestined. They're born to do good and born to be saved. So while they're on this earth, they act righteously. And of course, because that again then justifies their justifies their being saved. But there's no free will in this. The the elect cannot do wrong, even if they wanted to. They end up doing right, and of course they're saved for that. Now, to Calvin, there is a second covenant. In fact, there are three covenants. The second covenant occurs uh, with Isaac and Abraham. God says to Isaac, uh, to, to Abraham, I want you to sacrifice your son Isaac. And Abraham says, if God tells me to do it, I don't understand it, but it must be right takes his son up on the mountain and is about to kill him. And just as he does, God said, wait a minute, I was just testing him. Because you've been faithful, I will eventually give you an opportunity to lift original sin. And, of course, that opportunity um, to uh, the Puritans and to most other Christians comes with Christ coming to earth, God's son, being crucified, paying off everybody's debt. From there on, everybody starts from scratch. But to Calvin... What that really does is not clear everybody's slate, but simply give us a possibility to try to be saved. In other words, there's no, no guarantees after that. Um, again, the elect are the elect. They act, uh, they act perfectly, and this is perfectly just. Uh, Calvin stresses a God who is just, not a God who is merciful. Around the same time, there's another... Uh, Christian theologist called Arminius, Jacob Arminius, who was Dutch. And Arminius said that election was conditional. That is, you could both gain it and lose it. To uh, Calvin, you couldn't lose it. But uh, to Arminius, you could. Everybody had free will, and because they had free will, had, they had the chance to throw away election. Um, the atonement, according to uh, Arminius, was complete. God had paid everybody's gift, but you could still start in your own life and screw things up. Uh, the Puritans took from both sides. They believed in essentially in predestination, in the creation of an elect, a small group of people who are going to be saved, uh, and in the possibility of losing that election. In fact, one of the reasons why Puritans are seen as very sour people who hate, uh, who hate uh, dancing and singing and so on and didn't like Christmas, which of course is all true about them. Um, but, uh, in fact, H.L. Mencken said once that Puritanism is the nagging fear that somewhere somebody is having a good time. In fact, what the Puritans were concerned about was not so much fun in itself. To them, every, to them being members of the elect, in fact, in Bradford's group, in order to join Bradford's group of separatists, you had to do two things. First, you had to have a religious experience in which you felt God talked to you and said to you, you are one of the elect, you are one of my chosen. More, more than that, though, you then had to go in front of the congregation and convince them that you had really had such an experience and hadn't just imagined that you had such an experience. Because you can lose election to the Puritans, the Puritans felt that you had to be concerned all of the time with the condition of your soul. In fact, the average Puritan spent um, an hour or more a day, particularly at the end of the day, in a form of introspection, uh, examining their consciences for what they had done that day. Because to the Puritans, um, the world could end at any time. 
And when God blows the final whistle, you are stuck with the cards in your hands. In other words, you might have led a, led a blameless life most of your life, and about two days ago, you started committing sins. You haven't thought about them. Um, you haven't been sorry for them. Therefore, you're stuck with them. And because you're stuck with them, you would lose your election. You would be damned. So to the Puritans, having the opportunity to um, go to heaven at the end of the world, to be with God at the end of the world, and uh, was it, what better thing could you have? So you should really spend all of your time, according to the Puritans, making sure that your soul, your conscience, was completely clear in case the world ended, so you hadn't thrown away that great gift of election. Um, to this end, they continually examined their acts. Uh, one of the most important things about them is their belief that every action in the world is symbolic. It's a real action, but it also stands for something as well. Um, it's what might even call emblematic. Uh, for example, once uh, Jonathan Edwards, who's one of the people we're going to read a little bit later, he's a, a Puritan minister, was walking along with a friend, and he saw a snake about to eat a mouse. And the mouse bit the snake and got free. And Edward says, well, that's really strange. His friend said, it's not strange at all. This is God's way of showing us that um, defenseless as we are, like the mouse, we can resist if we struggle against the attacks of Satan, of course, who's represented by the snake. Every little action then was symbolic. It represented something. So they had to be very careful every day of their lives not to have done an act which could have slipped by. In other words, not to have done something which had symbolic repercussions that would become a sin um, and not to have noticed. That to them would have been a terrible thing to have had election in your hands and then inadvertently thrown it away. So they were continually examining their acts. The smallest details of ordinary life, the smallest events, could have a, a great symbolic content to them. So they continually examined um, their actions every day. Uh, because of this, they felt that the main God, uh, human beings, especially the elect, had two things that they had to do. Carry out God's work and make sure that their souls were in good shape. And that's, to them, everything else was a distraction. They were particularly, um, they particularly disliked, for example, dancing and games because they were frivolities, any of what they called the vanities of this world. Um, they weren't against drinking. The, uh, the Puritans drank. What they were against is drunkenness, because in drunkenness you, use, you lose your intellect, and then you might commit acts which would cause you to lose election. And losing election, of course, is the most terrible thing that could happen to a Puritan. Their, um, their dislike of Christmas um, came from their contention that Christmas is not really uh, Christ's birthday. To them, they believe Christ was born in uh, March or April, and that the reason that Christmas is celebrated, according to them, is that when Christianity came into Britain, it found there a fertility religion already being practiced. And part of that fertility, that the holidays that fertility religion were the two equinoxes, the two equal days of the year, and the longest and shortest day. Shortest day is, of course, December 22nd. Christmas is December 25th. There's been a lot of changes in the calendar which would account for the three-day three move. Now, to the pure, and one of the easiest ways to convince people to adopt new ideas is allow them to keep their own ideas and graft them onto the new ideas. So according to the Puritans, when Christianity came in, what they said to the, uh, the pagans who were there was, uh, you've been celebrating all along, but who you've been worshiping as God is not really God. It's sort of a branch manager. Your gods are now saints, and you can still talk to them and have them intercede with God, but there's really only one true God. Um, this course, and they had been celebrating, remember, one of their people give up their, their religion a lot quicker than they'll give up their holidays, even in those days. So they said, the big party that you have in the winter, you didn't know it, but you were celebrating Christ's birthday. So it's okay to keep that celebrating, but now you're going to be celebrating knowing what it is that you're celebrating. Um, to the Puritans, that was a compromise. The Puritans were very straight-laced. They did not believe there was any compromise on morality. Um, if Christ was born in March, then that's when you have to celebrate it. You can't move it to, to, um, to, Christ, to uh, the middle of, of the winter just to get some pagans to convert. They also didn't like dancing because, of the pa because it was a pagan ritual. Um, the, the, uh, the pagans in Britain had been, again, a fertility religion. 
So one of their primary festivals occurred in the spring. Um, and they believed in magic. Magic also believes in symbolic acts changing the world. Um, and so in order to get the crops to grow, everybody would uh, get together in the spring, take off their clothes, dance around, get wasted on, on uh, alcohol and mushrooms and whatever they could get their hands on, and have an orgy. And the orgy, of course, was to show the crops what they wanted done. And to them, the crops said, oh, I see, we want increase. We want things to increase, to be fruitful. And of course, the crops grew better. Now, dancing was the preliminary to that. So to the Puritans, dancing was a prelude to sex. And in fact, they had good reason for believing that. Um, the maypole, which you'll see in the reading from Bradford, was part of uh, what was left over of the pagan festival, even that much later. Um, in the springtime, during the May, the, the, uh, May festival, there was a pole put up, and the pole had streamers on it. And uh, the streamers were held by man, woman, man, woman, all the way around the circle. Now, they danced in and out, weaving the streamers over and under each other until they wrapped around the pole. This naturally brought everybody together underneath the pole, all very close and rubbing up against each other, um, already influenced by alcohol, by the excitement of the dance. And then, of course, they went off into the woods to gather May flowers. Most of the lovers would then come back in couples six, eight hours later with a few flowers wrapped around their heads and big smiles on their faces. Um, there were no motels at the time, so people went off in the woods to have sex anyway. So, and essentially, the orgy had sort of spread out and become individualized. But to the Puritans, of course, that's a terrible thing. Sex is so uh, abhorrent to them, and it wasn't abhorrent within marriage. They were not against passion. But to them, because marriage was one of the sacraments, sex outside of marriage, or between people who were married to people other than who, to whom they were married, um, was a very grave sin. In fact, it was such a distraction that they thought that they suppressed it of all of the things probably the most because it was the greatest distraction again. It took people's mind away from examining their consciences and making sure that symbolically they were doing the right thing. Um, they disliked games, of course, for the same reason. Games were a distraction. They led people not to uh, uh, keep their mind on the, cre the uh, taking care of their soul. One of the other things, by the way, that the Puritans wanted and were willing to fight and die over was seated communion. Uh, other parts of Christendom took communion, which is a, a, a sacrament involving um, the taking of bread and wine, itself a symbolic act um, representing Christ's sacrifice, the sacrifice of his blood and the sacrifice of his flesh. Um, and, of course, you can see how fanatical they were to be willing to die over whether or not you participate in that ritual seated or you participate in that ritual kneeling. They also believed that not only had the elect been picked, but that eventually that the world was going to end relatively abruptly. Although about a year before judgment, Christ was going to literally come to earth and found a physical kingdom in this world. In fact, the Puritans believed that they themselves were symbolic, each individual. They saw themselves as being the characters out of the Bible, come to life living a new version of the Bible. Um, they saw themselves, remember, as being selected by God. That's what the elect means. They're very special people, they felt, even though you could lose election. Um, and that they were here carrying out God's plan. And in fact, they came to America to establish Christ's kingdom on earth and to, to wait for, for Christ to come down and be at the head of it. They did not come here, as the popular myth is, to establish religious freedom. Nothing could be further from the truth. The Puritans didn't like, the separatists didn't even like other Puritans all that much. They, they liked other Protestants even less. They liked Catholics even less than that. And the pagans, they had no time for whatsoever. Uh, they didn't let other people be pure. Now, eventually, of course, they were outnumbered. But as much as they could, they forced people to be Puritans or get out of the colony. Um, they were very serious about their religion. For example, there was a man whose job it was to go around and search everybody's house every Sunday to make sure people came to church. Um, when they were in church, there was another guy who walked up and down the aisle carrying a long clothes prop with a, with a big brass ball on the end of it. And um, if you fell asleep, he would reach in with that clothes prop and whack you on the head with the brass ball to wake you up. Uh, the Puritans were very serious about what they, what they did. Um, naturally, to them, they were only doing you a favor because what you were doing was committing a sin, not coming to church or not staying awake in church. And they were 
punishing your body, but they were freeing your soul. Um, a lot of the torture and torment that went on during those days really derives from that idea. Um, somebody who's after your soul will do anything to your body without any kind of guilt whatsoever because ultimately they are saving you for immortality. Your clothing is just that your clothing, your body is just a wrapping. The essential part of you is the soul. So tormenting the body to save the soul is perfectly legitimate as far as they are concerned. Um, again, they did not come here to establish religious freedom. They came here to establish a Puritan kingdom on earth which they led by a theocracy, led by religious leaders, which they eventually expected Christ to come down and be at the head of. Now when they moved to uh, Holland, again they left, all, they left their money behind. They had to sneak out of England. When they got there, the Dutch treated them pretty well and they began to prosper. They prospered for um, two reasons. First was their idea of the calling. Um, to them, God gave everybody a job. Their way of worshiping God was to do that job to the best of their ability. If God made you a garbage man according to the Puritans, you ought to be the best garbage man that ever existed. If God made you a dyer of wool, a maker of cloth, then you ought to be the best cloth maker there ever could possibly be. No matter what job it was God put you in at the time, that was part of his plan. And your way of, um, of worshiping him was to carry out that plan to the best of your ability. Now, of course, for that reason, they made very, very high quality goods. Every job that a Puritan did was a good job because when a Puritan made cloth, which was the job, by the way, that they got when they went to Holland. Holland was sort of the garment district of the time. And they all got jobs as dyers and cloth makers and so on. And they worked enormously hard at it. They made each piece of cloth with the thought in mind that this was a gift to God. In other words, they made it as if they were making it for God, even though they were going to sell it to people. This meant that they made the best quality goods. Um, the second thing of their religion that allowed them to prosper while they were in Holland was, of course, their honesty. You can't go overcharging people during the day. That's a sin. Um, you have to be honest. You have to be just. So in a, uh, essentially in a society which haggled over the prices, took a lot of time. People came to buy something. Uh, the person who owned it said it was, they said, what does it cost? Um, the owner said, ten times what it was worth. The buyer offered one-tenth what it was worth. After about 15 minutes of arguing, they came to a price and the piece was sold. The Puritans put a fixed price on their goods. That meant that there was no haggling and the price was an honest price. It was a legitimate price. Generally, it was below the haggling price. So this naturally led them to prosper. People came to the, to the Puritans because they charged fair prices and because they made the best goods. However, this became a problem for the Puritans. Now, one of, the re, uh, one of the ways of determining whether you were the elect, the reasoning went this way. If God was going to put you here to do his work, he would give you the wherewithal to do it. In other words, if you were one of the elect, why would God give you a bad life? He would give you a good life. He would give you money and power and anything you needed to carry out his work. So being wealthy became evidence of being righteous. But the righteousness had to come first. What the Puritans were afraid of, and what eventually destroyed Puritanism, although it did dominate um, America for the first century or even more, perhaps even a lot of uh, Puritanism is still left over today, was this idea that, you know, being one of the elect and um, the materialism was an indication that you were the elect. What they were afraid of, though, and what eventually happened was that people began to gain the goods and because they had the money, say, I must be one of the elect. And of course, that's got things backwards. As you, as you know, um, all rich people are not honest and righteous people. Um, you, in fact, the easiest way to get rich is to be totally dishonest. So they saw wealth as a corrupting influence. Wealth was important. Appearance were certainly not against success. They saw success, however, as evidence that they were part of the elect. They were afraid, though, that once you start going after the goods, you stop living the good life, and therefore you really can't possibly be one of the elect. Um, while they were in Holland, as I had said, they began to prosper. And they began to worry because they said, our children are becoming, first of all, they're not even English anymore. They're becoming Dutch. And this wealth is going to corrupt them. So what we have to do is to leave this place. And, of course, they came to America. They came to America with the belief that they were coming here to literally found God's kingdom on earth. 
Um, when Bradford writes to Plymouth Plant, the history of the Plymouth Plantation, he says that it's a history. His purpose, however, is that Puritans in the future, when times get rough, will be able to look back and read this account of the original separatists coming to America, see the great sufferings that they went through, and say, well, if they could, if they could, uh, if they could continue, if they could persevere under those conditions, so can we. In other words, all their acts were symbolic acts. The trip itself was a symbolic act. They saw themselves, Bradford saw them uh, himself and other Puritans really as heroes in a great cosmic drama uh, which was unfolding. They were carrying out God's plan. That made them very important people. It also made everything that happened in their life symbolic. Now, the Puritans, by the way, weren't um, in entirely sour all the time. They were terrified of losing election. Uh, in fact, the idea of a, a hell where people are burned and tortured eternally is really only a physical representation of the true uh, terror. The true terror is the loss of election. Um, to, the, to the Puritans, the worst thing that could happen to you is that you were damned. And being damned really meant that you had lost the opportunity to be with God. Um, think, of, think of somebody that you love. Think what it's like to be without them forever and to know that you could have been with them forever, but you blew it. You had it in your hands and you let it go. That's a terrible, terrible thought to the Puritans. Um, to them, being um, without the presence of God is the worst thing that can possibly happen to you. And to have that continual longing for God and that continual realization that you could have been with God, you could have been saved, you could have been one of the elect, but you threw it all away is the real torment of eternity. Now, they spent their time naturally then trying to prevent election, and they were terrified that they might inadvertently or they might uh, intentionally have committed some sin that stays on their conscience and would get them damned. However, that part of them made the sour vision that we have of the Puritans. But they weren't entirely like that. Um, as I said, they drank, although they didn't drink the drunkenness. Um, they had a practice which they called bundling when it was very uh, cold. People all got together in the same bed under the same covers and huddled together. And there wasn't, they were, they were fully dressed, but for a Puritan that was Pretty distract could be pretty distracting in itself. Um, they were also joyful people. Now, when we read Jonathan Edwards, you'll see both sides of the Puritans. Um, the joy comes out of the recognition of the wonderfulness of God's creation. Remember, to the Puritans, everything is symbolic. A tree is not just a tree. A tree is an example of God's presence in the world, the wonderful complexity of creation. Um, a snail, for example. Thus is just a slimy creature that most people don't particularly like. Um, but to the Puritans, a Puritan would have looked at a snail and said, this is not a snail. This is a symbol God has sent us. Let's look at the snail. The snail advances over very rough, sharp stones and little jagged pieces that would just tear off its underside if it weren't for the fact that it lays down this highway, to us it's a highway of slime, on which it travels. Now, to the Puritan, Puritan would have looked at a snail and said, you see, what God is trying to tell us is that we can go by all the, all the terrible, destructive parts of sin if we only lay down this path of righteousness uh, by our own actions to travel on. Everything, again, was symbolic to them. And because of this, whenever they saw any part of creation, they saw in it the presence of God. Everything to them was proof of God's existence. And God's existence to them went hand in hand with God's mercy, with, with the elect, with saving some of the people, which they happened to believe themselves to be. Now, naturally, they were, while they were terrified of losing election, they were enormously relieved and enormously joyful to be one of the elect. The fact that they were going to be saved, that they would be with God forever, was a wonderful thing to them, and it made them enormously happy. The problem, of course, is that while they were walking around admiring God's creation, seeing in it God's presence in the world, inevitably following right on the heels of that joy was the terror that you could lose all of that. And you could lose all of that, of course, by being sinful. And in order to avoid being sinful, the thing was to examine your conscience, to live a perfect life, to realize that all actions in the world were symbolic. What I'd like you to do for um, 
next time is to read William Bradford. I'll put the assignment up. You'll see it on the screen for several minutes uh, in a moment. And while you're reading it, I'd like you to think of two things. One, does Bradford treat the world as if it's symbolic? And secondly, if he does, is he manipulating the story as he tells it symbolically? In other words, is he telling straightforward history? Objectively, this is exactly what happened. Or is he manipulating the events, giving emphasis to some, de-emphasizing others, and so on, in order to create a particular point of view? If he's doing the first, he's writing history. If he's doing the second, he's writing literature. So when, while you do this reading, I'd like to think about those two things. Is, uh, is Bradford just describing events in the world, or is he describing symbolic events, and is he manipulating his description in any way? Um, what you'll now see on the screen will be the reading assignment, um, which comes, by the way, out of uh, the Norton Anthology of American Literature, Volume One. Make sure that you uh, make sure that you uh, that you get Volume One. There is Volume Two. I'll uh, uh, close up on the uh, on the book in a second, and you'll you'll see the the reading assignment over it. Um, when you finish copying the reading assignment, that's essentially the uh, end of the class, and would somebody please? This is the assignment, pages 26 through 40. Uh, in Bradford, uh, the book is a little bit blurry, but I think, I think you can see the cover. It's essentially an outdoor scene with uh, two rocky cliffs and um, two people look like out of Ben Franklin's era standing on it. Actually, we'll, we'll see it again in the, in the Romantic period. It's, in fact, a romantic landscape, but that's something we'll come to a little bit later in the course. Uh, again, it's Bradford, pages 26 through 40. That assignment includes Book 1, Chapter 9, of their voyage and how they passed the sea and of their safe arrival at Cape Cod, which starts on page 26. Book 2, Chapter 11, the remainder of Anno 620, the Mayflower Compact, the Starving Time, which starts on page 32. Book 2, Chapter 19, Anno Domini, 1628, Thomas Morton of Marymount, which starts on page 35. And Book 2, Chapter 23, Anno Domini, 632, Prosperity Brings Dispersal of the Population. Um, of course, then, the entire assignment runs from page 26 to page 40. It's part of William Bradford's History of the Plymouth Plantation.